my father was German and he hated nationalism because he felt that it led to wars. So he made his own passport and his own flag. And he travelled on these as a citizen of the world for the rest of his life. He was a man of strong convictions. And so was my mother, who joined him to sail around the Pacific in a small boat without being married, and she was the navigator. And she could find an island that was just two feet above sea level and about half a mile wide with a sextant and a compass. And many of their friends were people who'd survived the Second World War and ended up in the other side of the world trying to make sense of what had happened and trying to create a new life for themselves. And so I grew up amongst people who asked, what is the point of having a life? And how should we best use it? And what should guide us? And these questions settled on my heart. They made me rather serious. I remember writing a poem when I was a teenager that said, I'm like the Statue of Liberty, too serious to take to a party. <laughs> so I studied comparative religion and philosophy at university. I ran my own businesses my way. Then I went and did an MBA to find other ways to run businesses. I lived through the 1980 neoliberal reforms, and I worked through that time. And I found myself less and less able to offer my clients enduring and practical solutions. My clients were workers and managers in organisations. And so I left and I did more study. And this time I did a thesis on putting spirituality at the foundation of work. And I did more courses. But it was only in my 50s that I found what I'd been looking for. And it was a map. And it was called The Map of Meaning. And it's the work of Mario Lane Lips Viesma. She's now a professor at Auckland University of Technology, and she based her research on the work of Viktor Frankl, who'd survived the concentration camps, and said, well, maybe the question, what is the meaning of life, is just too big for us to answer. But what we can answer is, what is the meaning of my life today? And so Mario Lane asked the question, what has been meaningful to you in the past three weeks? And out of the answers she got, she built a PhD. And the summation of that was the map as it was 20 years ago. And it turned out I wasn't weird or serious. Actually, everybody's pretty much engaged with these questions in some way or other. So I joined and started to work with Mario Lane, and then the coaches and consultants, researchers, that came to work with us, who also cared passionately about creating some meaningful work and meaningful organisations. And we began to develop ways to use the map of meaning and to share that with people in different parts of the world. Now, for myself, I could at last find a way to be engaging with those big questions and those daily questions in a very practical way. And I started to experiment. I thought, OK, how do I create a meaningful day? And I used the map. Or I'd sit in a meeting and I'd think, right, well, that was meaningful. And then something happened. Like, we all just went, ooh. <laughs> so what happened there? And was that just me? Or was that everybody? And I used it to make decisions. Should I go here or there? And I designed my business through it. And it worked. And it worked because meaning is as important to human beings as water. When something's meaningful to us, it's like we know what our purpose is, we're engaged, we're full of energy. It's like we're plugged into an energy supply of some kind. And then when meaning goes, it's like, whoops, <laughs> I'm just wandering around on reserve batteries of some kind. Sort of saying to myself, honestly, can't see the point. Honestly, why do we bother? And that's what meaning sounds like a lot in organisations. But in, for me, it ends up playing patience a lot. And because one of the problems with meaning is that it comes and it goes. So I can start the morning full of energy and then find myself playing patience. So what happened? Well, you know, 
Netflix if it's bad. <laughs> so what happened? It's easy to make it my fault and think that I lack motivation and maybe go online and look at 10 ways to motivate myself. But the problem is it often doesn't help me with my problem. And what our research shows is that feeling disengaged and frustrated is actually the response of a healthy person when something that's meaningful to them is damaged or destroyed. It's a sign that we actually still care what happens and how we use our time and our talent and our energy and that it's in some way that's worthwhile to us and it hurts us if it's ignored by somebody or destroyed. And that makes it very, very important that we know what's important to us because we can protect it. So some of the things that are important to me is a sense of belonging. You know, I want to be with people where I share values and I feel at home. I want to use my talents to the full. I also want to do inspiring work that bears fruit in the real world. But a list isn't a map. So let's make a map out of the list, which is in essence what Mario Lane did. And suddenly things seem quite different. I can see there are a number of things that make life and work meaningful and that they perhaps all need to be in play in order for me to find that. I can certainly see that they interact with each other and they may impact, those dimensions may impact each other. And I wonder what that relationship is. For myself, I can see why my work's so meaningful. I mean, I'm totally inspired by the map. It's new knowledge and it offers really practical hope for human beings. I'm, it aligns with my values, so I have integrity with self. I certainly have to use my talents to the full. And I'm working with colleagues around the world and we make a difference in reality. And yet, I still find myself playing patient. So what happens? <laughs> It's obviously not that I lack motivation, actually. It's that many has got disconnected. And I can look at the map, and then I can go, oh, I see, I was going paying off my bills, and I suddenly looked at my bank balance and went, oh, well, <clears throat> the reality of that makes a bit of a nonsense about my dream to go over and do some more study in overseas. Or maybe I've just been working on my own too long. Or maybe I've reached the end of my talents in a particular area. And with the map, I can see that, and then I can answer my own problem. And I can think, oh, what if I did some, a workshop overseas and paid for my trip? Or who would I love to work with, and what could we create together? Or who could I learn from that would be inspiring? So I can solve my own problems. I can see where meaning is missing, but I can also see where maybe meaning gets jammed down in some area because most of us have got ways we prefer to generate meaning. And I remember a young man saying to me, oh, right, too much time with the boys, I just ended up doing stupid stuff because he lost the ability to speak out for himself. Or a woman, I remember bursting into tears when she saw the map. And she said, this is what my son's been telling me for years. Mum, you've got to stop looking after everybody else all the time. You've got to care for yourself. But I want to be the best Christian I can be, and that looks like serving people. But she said, when I look at it through the map, I can see, actually, I've got to care for myself so I can care for others. And when she was offered eight hours of extra work, she said, I was able to look at the map and think, no, I can't do that. I might have said yes in the past, but now I'm going to say no. And she could hold her ground. So she could protect what was important to her. And just as when we get lost in a city, we can take out our GPS and get found and get going, so it is with the map of meaning. And this I find very strange. That meaning, which is so vague and philosophical, is actually at the heart of my ability to act and to act powerfully. Now, the good news is that we carry this map with us always because it's in the way that we respond to life. And that way we can fine tune. So just as we learn our way around a city, we can learn to recognise it in ourselves. And that means we can adjust to whatever happens. I remember 
some years ago, I got the diagnosis. And when my blood count, white blood count was low, I got very frightened of people. And I said to my daughter, darling, I'll be fine. I'll just stay home. And she went, mum, <coughs> they send them home where there are pets and children. You'll be fine. Remember the map. You need people. Go out. Meet people. Sit in cafes. And I did. And now I'm obviously getting older. And the map continues to offer me insights. I've been working with an organisation called Meaningful Australia, Australia for the last two years. And we've created a handbook that helps us as we age and the people who care for us give us the best chance of having a meaningful life right to the end. So... People are using the map in Australia, in Romania, <coughs> in China, in Japan, the States, Brazil, the UK, the USA. And they're using it in areas like ageing or organisational development or linking it to wellbeing economics or using it in health and education. And because we share this. Because the map has a universality, we share the framework, even though each one of us makes meaning in our very own unique way. And when we have a shared framework, we have a very strong place, I think, in which we can stand together in a sort of deep democracy. Because no one is any better than anyone else when it comes to finding meaning. We're all equal. And with a shared framework and a shared understanding and a shared language, we have a very, very powerful way and a constructive way to respond to whatever life throws at us. Now, Robert E. Quinn, who's a professor of positive psychology at Michigan University, said to us, you know, today people are really lost. And when they're lost, they become desperate for guidance. And the maps that we choose to guide us will profoundly impact the future that we create together. So thank you.